Cube. At Big Data SV 2014 is brought to you by headline sponsors WAN Disco. We make Hadoop invincible. And Actian, accelerating Big Data 2.0. Okay, we're back here live in Silicon Valley. This is Silicon Angle and Wikibon's The Cube, our flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by my co-host, Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. And we're here live to talk about big data with all the action in Silicon Valley is happening right here at the Hilton. And behind us at the Santa Clara Convention Center is the Strata Conference. A lot of big data happening, a lot of business being done, a lot of tech being talked about. But of course, we have theCUBE, which is extracting the signal from the noise with all the best tech athletes. And our next guest, we're excited to have legend Andre Bouvier on theCUBE. Thank you very much for coming. Board member of Actian, industry legend, been around the block more, more times than us and has more war stories. So we're going to dig into great conversation. Pleasure to have you on theCUBE. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I love, love to hear the stories. We were talking before we, we, we came on live about some of the experiences around how Larry Ellison started Oracle uh, and big data. I got, we always ask the, the folks would come on, have you seen this movie before? You know, we've seen this. You've seen many movies and cycles of innovation. How would you compare this innovation cycle that we're in now uh, to compared to other ones that you've seen? Well, I guess I've been fortunate enough in, in life. I started in, in this business in 1976 uh, by joining IBM. Actually, I was a microcoder. I used to write microcode for mainframe assist for instructions for MVS. So I saw that I, I landed at IBM at a fortunate time when the customers were no longer bringing their data to IBM to get their data processed and then going back to their office with the results. IBM started to say, well, geez, why don't we bring the computers to you? And IBM started to sell computers. That's when computers got down to a relatively affordable numbers, but I guess I could share with you back then, uh, a 5.5 uh, a MIP machine with 16 megs was roughly 5.5 million bucks. That's just, that's just a CPU. And First of example of function shipping. Yeah, <laughs> but, but it obviously had a value because customers, when I was there, we could sell every single copy that we could build. We couldn't build them fast enough. That's when customers decided that there was value to automating mundane processes. So the first thing that they did is they brought these computers on board at home in their data centers, and the first thing they automated was mundane tasks but needed to be done, payrolls, AP, AR, and so on, and that's why it was called data processing hence the title of Data Processing Manager. And as the customers, and then I lived through when as the customers started to pick up data, they said, hey, there's some value in that data. What about if we were to make decisions based on that data? So being Canadian, I left and I joined a small, struggling Canadian startup at the time uh, called Cognos. This is 1989, and it was struggling. We had about nine months worth of cash at hand. And so we decided we did a joint, pro uh, a, a joint uh, project with Procter & Gamble. And we built a product called Impromptu and PowerPlay, which is basically built on, on Microsoft Windows because Bomber had worked for Procter & Gamble, so Procter & Gamble loved Microsoft software. And at that time, I was saying, Jesus, Windows really an operating system? Real men run MVS. But <laughs> I certainly learned that, that <laughs> they, they, they certainly learned that there was a change. So there was a change that was basically client server. So we were extracting data from mainframes, moving them onto a Microsoft platform. And we were giving uh, clients, like, and I, when I say product managers, in the sense of Procter & Gamble, these are people that either manage a toothpaste or a product line. And so they were able to drill down and extrapolate and envision what the data, you know, based on this. And so, okay, well, why are sales down in Brazil? Well, let's drill down. Let's look at it. Is it specific to a date, to a, a specific time of year, or a specific geographical area of Brazil, right? We're doing well in Sao Paulo, but not well in and, uh, and Rio, right? So they were able to make decisions. So visualization, that's why I kind of laugh when I hear Tableau and quickly. That was 1989. We didn't call it BI, it didn't exist, okay? We called them information systems, right? EIS, in fact, executive information systems. Right. And so, but we, I, we learned quickly that there's value to be extrapolated by going into the data that you've accumulated within a silo, meaning your, your own enterprise, and then making business decisions. But again, you're still depending on that human being able to extrapolate what they're visualizing and with their own biases, kind of putting an experience, putting the next dot on the board, which could or cannot be accurate sometimes. And so then I moved on to uh, predictive analytics. And so this is really where I had a lot of enjoyment is, uh, and eventually became the president of SAS Institute, which is the largest privately held software company in the world in predictive analytics, uh, three billion in revenue so far uh, last year. And um, so I really got to see the value uh, that customers will pay you a lot of more money for an ugly looking green bar report 
but that is fairly accurate in predicting what tomorrow is going to look like than giving them a nice three-dimensional color graphics of how much money they lost yesterday. And so I really, I think of all the jobs I've had, I think this is the one that was really, really interesting because it's amazing if you can build models that, 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 that with a high level of uh, predictability allows customers to predict what the future will look like. And so therefore you take all the human element out and everything. You're putting in weather information, you're putting in uh, uh, you know, uh, basically financial information, economics uh, information and so on, so that retailers, insurance companies and so on. I, I'll leave it nameless, but there was a large insurance company I used to deal with and they would sit there and they would uh, do models and say, where do we think we're going to get hit in the Gulf? Where do we think we're going to get hit on the East Coast? Where do we think Tornado Alley is going to look like this year? And based on that, the chief risk officer would sit there and say, okay, the following zip goes, no more. We're not writing any new policies. And by the way, people who don't make their payments, following zip goes, cut them off. And then next year we'll revisit where we want to insure. Andre, I want to ask you a question. This is, first of all, I, this is awesome. We can just keep the cameras rolling all, all night long. Um, but I got to ask you an interesting question that we don't usually get on the cube, um, given, given your mm -hmm. leadership and what you've done and what you're working on now. Obviously, Actium we'll get to in a minute, but because it's a great corporate development maneuver. Dave and I were commenting in New York about that play. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to ask you about leadership. Mm -hmm. okay? In a time of change we're in now, mm -hmm. the winds are shifting, yep. and the, the money's on the table, yep. and now it's a, you know, everyone's racing to swim out to the barge and get that cash, right? So get that value. So I want to ask you about leadership, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think of the leaders out there right now, the old captains of industry like the Joe Tucci's, the John Chambers, mm -hmm. uh, to the new upstarts? Mm -hmm. And what does it take to be a good leader? If you can comment about Tucci and Chambers, that'd be great. Right, so they're two very different uh, individuals. And funny enough, uh, they both are somewhat related because um, if you go back in history, I actually worked for Joe Tucci and Dave Goulden when we took uh, Wang out of Chapter 11 and had a legal counsel actually for uh, Wang was John Chambers. And so, obviously, they went their, their separate directions. I, I've got a lot of respect for both. What Joe has realized, I think, is he's forming these, these, these spin-off companies because he recognizes that if he keeps it within a big monolithic companies where you've got to make a number, I mean, Wall Street somewhat creates their own problem, that he can only do so much as a public company. And so by s spinning off some of these assets and doing joint ventures like he did with GE, right, those are great, with Pivotal, those are great moves. It, it's, it stimulates growth. You like those moves. I like those moves. And uh, so I'm a big fan of what Joe's done. Uh, Cisco is a different model, right, where they, they've done some acquisitions like WebEx, and they've done some related uh, acquisitions, but they're not, in my view, not as aggressive. But again, you've got to give it to John. He's done a great job with Cisco. Uh, one could argue it's always easier on this side of the table to, to, to criticize people and say, geez, but you know, I think he could have grown at a faster rate. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I'm still a big fan. I'm a, I'm a shareholder in, in Cisco and have been since I met John uh, back in uh, 1994. You mentioned Larry Ellison. What do you think about Mark Benioff's uh, move out of Oracle? What do you think about his moves? Well, again, ironic, Mark used to work for me at Oracle. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's a small world. Oh, so I, <laughs> so, so uh, Mark was pretty wild at the time. Tom Siebel, so, too? Yeah, no, no, Tom was not. But, I got there. And, uh, but Mark, uh, Mark is a very clever guy, very creative. And so... That's the polite term of saying he was kind of hard to manage at time, but a very bright guy. He Eagles are hard to nail down, right? Yep. I mean, hold down. Yeah, and, but, but he did, uh, I will, and I've said that to him many times, is he's done more with, uh, with his company than I would have ever thought he could have gone. And I think, frankly, I think if you were to talk to him privately, I think he would admit that it's gone much further than he thought he was. But the other thing I think that surprises me of Mark, and again, I'm not saying it in a demeaning fashion, but it's really been pleasant to, for me anyway, gratifying to see how he's matured as an individual because you've got him in credit. He knows how to hire. And he's done a great job of hiring very, very good talent. And he's got a good sense of where the industry is going. And now he's got his challenges as well. His platform is, what, 10 years old now, right? So what, what, what was very avant-garde at the time, you know, he's now starting to live with same of the same problems that IBM is living with, with Oracle's living with, and others. He's which running says, on Oracle, right? I mean, it's, and he's running on Oracle. Exactly. Well, yeah. He, yeah, the parts. I mean, he's running, you know, Red, yeah. uh, Rails, and uh, you know, so he's running some yeah, 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 some yeah. some open source components. But you're correct in saying that. And uh, so, you know, he, and that's the thing is, when you're a publicly traded company, it's easy to criticize, but when you're running a publicly traded company. It's very hard for you to go to your investors and say, guys, would you give me a break for a year or two years and understanding when I'm revamping some of this and I'm changing some of that and 
the profitability may not be there while I do that. Wall Street doesn't want to hear that. Right? So I, but since we're, we're on a roll here with, uh, yep, you know, what do you think of these companies? <laughs> I got to ask you about Workday. I yep. mean, you know, this is a company that has seemingly executed at every single step of the way. Um, I mean, surpassing you know many expectations. What's your take on Workday? So I'm a big fan, and uh, and again, I uh, kind of ironic. I actually got to know Dave. Duffio. Dave used to work for you, no? Right? No, no, I wish <laughs> he refused to work <laughs> but, for you. But uh, <laughs> but, uh, but Dave actually, when I was at IBM, Dave was a customer. He had a company with an MRP package that ran on the AS400, and I was the AS400 uh, tools developer, uh, the manager for that in the Toronto lab. And so we met, and he said, uh, "Andre, will this ever be client server?" You got to remember, this is an 18, a 1988 conversation. Yeah, right. And um, he was uh, across the bay here, and uh, Walnut well, Creek to be precise. And I met with him and his brother, and I said, Dave, I may get you from a green screen to a color screen, but that's about it. It's a dumb head, no functionality, no distribution. All the functionality is on the S400. And he said, thank you very much. And didn't hear from him. And one day I read the papers, and uh, he sold the company. And because he couldn't migrate his install base to where he thought the world was going with client server, moved up the street, started PeopleSoft. And he rode that one. And one would argue that says, Larry thinks he won, but I don't really know if Larry won when he bought PeopleSoft. Because Dave then took that and had no install base to worry about, plenty of capital. Gave him a time bomb. Best thing that ever <laughs> happened to him. Yeah. Right. And went and started Workday. And Workday was engineered with all the latest technology. It's an object-oriented database. I mean, he's really... And I can tell you personally, I have a friend of mine that's, uh, and I won't name the company, but uh, pretty reasonable uh, uh, IT budget. It's a $2.3 billion budget annual. And uh, he put in Workday. And I said, so any issue? He says, yeah, I've got an issue. He said, the end users love it so much that they're forcing me right, to, to, uh, to, to replace PeopleSoft at a faster rate than I was ready to replace it in other geographies. So. To answer your question, yeah, you I just look at numbers, right? With, to me, the, the, the biggest test is, are the customers buying it? How do they feel about it? And so they've done a very, very good job of understanding exactly what the end user wanted and built the right application. Let's talk about the uh, yeah. consumerization trend that's going on. You mentioned mm -hmm. that, you know, brings me to you talking about that, the dumb, the dumb node at the end, the head of, head of the network. Now it's getting more functionality. The consumerization trend, consumerization of IT, mm -hmm. uh, mobile devices, you see Google out there. What do you yep. think of like Google's of the world who are saying, hey, you know, we're just going to go to the consumer layer and that soon will be adopted by the enterprise. And how does that fit into the cloud? And, and the trends we're seeing with Amazon, for instance. So Amazon and Google, what's your comments on those guys? Yes, yeah, so I'm not a real expert on the consumer side. I'm more of an enterprise guy. But if you look at what they've done, really, if you, if you look at what Google is, I mean, if you look at the amount, most people don't realize they own their own fiber from here to Asia Pacific, from here across the continent, across the continent into Europe. And really what they've done is, if you really look at it, if you, if you want to paint it this way, you can put a cover, a metal cover around the world and really, Google's inside as a computer. What is a computer? It's a, he just distributed the functionality across the world. I think I have a lot of respect for Google, and I think that you know, some people are scared of them. Uh, they, uh, but I can tell you that, uh, frankly, I'm amazed at what they've done. Uh, and, and of course, they're always pushing the envelope in regards to you know, moving into in-memory, right? And, moving the, and, and pushing the envelope on the technology. So I have a I have a lot of respect for them. I mean, I'm sure your user, Google, yeah. your user, yeah. Google. <laughs> then it's interesting to see what they're doing with the database, not only what they did with, with Big Table, but you're seeing you know, new models of database that they're putting forth with things like Spanner, and mm -hmm. you know, it's fascinating. Now, you've also uh, helped incubate, invest in, advise a number of companies, uh, Pentaho, yep. uh, Revolution Analytics, Enos, uh, yeah. and others. Uh, and you mentioned, uh, uh, um, we were talking about open source, you've got a, a background in open source even though you came out of the mainframe world. So I wonder if you could comment on the whole open source movement, the, the new mm -hmm. sort of trend that that's yep. bringing to the world and, and where that fits into your sort of investment strategy. Okay, so it was kind of coincidentally, I was asked by uh, one of the board members of uh, VA Linux to sit on the board. And uh, so, and I got to know the A and VA, Larry Augustin, he's the A and VA. And uh, so being on the board, I was always intrigued by what SourceForge. Hey, geez, look at these projects. And then I started to go through these projects and I said, you know, if you stitch some of these projects together, we could probably build a platform and compete with some of my ex-employers. And in fact, uh, not to get too distracted, I was on the NT advisory board in the early 90s for Microsoft and Gates used to tell us all the time, you don't, you don't capitalize your market, I will. 
And it always stuck in my mind. I said, well, you know, why couldn't we use open source to go capitalize and lower the cost? So that's when we formed Pentaho. So mm -hmm. we're a bunch of ex, you know, Cognos, Hyperion, and so on, yeah. uh, founders, and so we built all this free software you cobble together, right? It's free, but it's not that easy because first you had to learn this in 2004 when we founded the company is, you know, when we went to the law firm said we want to buy these open source projects. So we want to buy Kettle out of Belgium. We want to buy a J3 reports out of Germany. We want to buy an OLAP mm -hmm. engine here in town uh, uh, called Mondrian. How do we do that? Is it, what am I yeah. buying? Is it copyrights? Is it the license? What lawyers didn't even know at the time. So we had to start working with the you lawyers. Did, you, had the, you were president of creation. You yeah. had to write the contracts. Yep. So, and we acquired those properties and uh, we did it. And, the other thing that was interesting, and, and again, a lot of it's luck in this business. I happened to, to live in Raleigh at the time, and of course, I'm Canadian, and the founder of Red Hat's Canadian, and I got to see how Red Hat did it. And mm -hmm. so you figured it out, and, you, and I asked him, I said, I don't understand why the U.S. government is your largest customer at that time. I mean, it's open source. And he said, exactly. I said, no, no, I, well, okay, I don't get the exactly. <laughs> and he said, well, in a proprietary operating system, when let's say use Windows, and I don't want to, you know, Windows or Solaris, I'm not picking on any of them, but you know, let's say somebody decides, a hacker decides to go and hack into that system. It takes a lot of complaints and, uh, before they start saying, geez, you know, I think maybe somebody did break into here. Let's look into this. And the last thing they want to do is put a public message out there. Somebody broke into the operating system and there's a malicious code in there and it could be hacking. In the open source world, here it is. I mean, I learned that at Pentaho. You, 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 we did a nightly build, you put it out there. And while you're sleeping, there's always an engineer that wants to show they're smarter than your engineer. <laughs> and so, let's pick an example. Somebody in, in, in uh, New Zealand is taking your code apart. It's open source. And then they call you, and they say, you know what? And they don't even call you. By the time you get up, there's a message out there, and they say, hey, you know what? I found this problem. And if you're, 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 you handle it right, you say, good catch. Would you contribute that fix? And I want to incorporate it. And so you're constantly getting yeah. people looking at your code. So getting back to this analogy with Red Hat, they're saying who in their right mind is going to go put a malicious bug right, in Linux when you've got thousands of people every night going through this code? They're going to find them immediately. And by the way, the open source community does cleanse itself. And taboo, you know, just get, you know, they'll just yeah. shun this individual. It washes it out of the system. So I never even thought of that aspect. So, so open source, you can, you can, you can get contributions. You're constantly having people doing QA on it, right? And, and uh, from a security perspective, it's open. So it's secure. So there's a lot of advantage. And so I started to, you know, the, so obviously Pentaho was, you know, reporting and analysis at the time. Uh, uh, Xenos was, uh, was uh, systems management. Uh, Compierre was uh, ERP. So I found that certain models work and, and uh, certain industries work and some don't. And so, again, if you just well, yeah, He'll fix that for you. So okay. Dave, I want to get to Dave. So Dave, um, what's your take on what, um, his comments about Workday? I mean, it makes total sense to what, what they said. Well, so um, uh, you're seeing, seeing very interesting sort of trends here in the Valley, obviously. I mean, we, we had Actian, Actian on earlier, and I'm, I'm interested, Andre, in sort of what led you to, to Actian. Essentially, you know, spending, let's say, uh, upwards of $100 million rolling up you know, mm -hmm. various parts of the company. We were talking, John, you know, it sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but actually it's really not. If mm -hmm. you can make clever investments, you can get to market much, 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 much sooner. So um, what did lead you to, to Actian? How did you get yeah, there? So actually, Terry Arnett. So Terry and I got together, and Terry said, look, I bought this property called Ingress. And so I've got a, a very good relational database uh, that's generating good cash, right? Because, you know, the people don't abandon databases that work, right? So there was a good install base. And then we determined that says, look, the relational model has probably been pushed as far as it can. Uh, Oracle may not agree with that, but you know, we do think that the uh, relational model has been pushed to areas where it's not really suitable. So then we bought another company uh, out of Germany on the object-oriented uh, database. And we said, okay, for certain application, an object-oriented database is the right way to go. Uh, then we bought VectorWise out of Holland which is really an SMP, columnar database for analytics. And then we bought ParXL, which is massively parallel, okay, database, right, for analytics. And by the way, it's the foundation, as you know, of Redshift, which is what Amazon is using. So we have people today that develop and test on Amazon and deploy on-premise. 
and some do deploy also on Amazon as well. Mm -hmm. So they do everything on Amazon. So it's not a roll up in the sense of a CA where you build multiple products of the same nature and you just economy of scales. They were thought through acquisitions of how do you put the pieces together. And Pervasive was the, the crown jewel where we said, okay, now you gotta be able to integrate data, right? Both on premise and in the cloud. And that was the, the piece that we got from Pervasive. And John called it data fusion. Exactly. So, how, exactly. so take us through the dialogue. I mean, obviously you see the opportunity, you mentioned in your story about the open source, how you see the opportunity to get these open source projects, same with Actian. Mm -hmm. The market's shifting. You guys saw an opportunity to pull yep. all this together. Yep. I mean, was it a fast conversation? Was it pretty much, here's what we want to do? Was there a lot of strategic planning involved? No, the, the advantage, uh, you know, Terry's a pretty smart guy. He, uh, he gets it pretty quickly, and Terry's a fabulous to work with. And so, no, these decisions got made pretty quickly. And uh, we, being, that's the advantage of being private. We are at a size and profit where if we wanted to go public, we could. And we're not yet. And the reason we're not yet is we still have some work that we want to do. And when you're private, there's lots of things you can do that you don't have to share outside the family. Uh, and we're not finished yet. So when big data came along, by the way, so let's get to the firm big data and maybe tie you back to the beginning comments I made. What you're going to see now is an advent of a new position in many corporations like CDO, chief data officer. And in fact, I was with mm. the chief data officer of Barclays yesterday here in town. And the reason- He was on the cube. Was uh, Osama uh, on, on the cube? Was it, uh, Osama Fayed is the uh, CDO. Osama Fayed. Uh, okay, anyway, we'll come back but, to it. So, Derek, something. But, but, th and the reason that's happening. Sorry, TD Ameritrade, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm no, not, that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but what's <laughs> Barclay, happening, though. Couldn't make it because they had that yeah, library. Yeah, they had that LIBOR issue. That's, yeah, that's the word. Right. <laughs> 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 they have their challenges. But, <laughs> so what's happening, though, as I said, is, the, is we, I, I live through data processing managers to then CIOs, where their job was to extract uh, value out of the, the information, initially in one silo, then across multiple silos, but always within an enterprise. And now the CDO's job is to say, okay, but I've got to be able to tap the big data that's coming in, okay, from other sources, okay? So, so and I mean, and as you well know, it's everything from road sensors, to, I mean, I could go on and on about different types of applications that I've seen, and so Hadoop is a, to us is just another great data store where you first put the information in, and then in some cases you'll be able to do some processing within Hadoop, but we also believe in some cases you'll want to extract, extract that and put it into like an Acteon platform then to do some... some so I love this thing. conversation about the CDO. We do a <clears throat> conference every year with the, the folks at MIT on yep. the chief data officer, mm -hmm. and it's something that we, we agree with. We believe that that role you know, is emerging and, and will emerge. It's not mainstream yet. Yep. My question is, do you think the CDO, the chief data officer, should report to the CIO, or is there an independent position? Why or why not? So it's funny, I'm working with a large pharmaceutical company right now and helping them define that, and the way they're going to do it is it's actually going to be parallel. So the CIO is really going to run the internal, and the CDO is actually going to work very close to the, C the CIO, but in parallel. And because their mission is somewhat different. And so in this case, by the way, and I'll, I'll leave it again nameless, but it's a large pharmaceutical company that decided that they no longer want to spend a lot of money marketing, or not mar yeah, I guess it's marketing, marketing, not selling, marketing to and informing doctors about why they should prescribe their drugs. They've decided to do is they took a billion dollars, which sounds like a lot of money, but it's small in their world, a billion dollars out of their sales and marketing budget. And the CEO has allocated that now to, the, uh, to a new project. They want to hire a CDO, and the CDO has got to figure out how do I get directly to the end user, the potential end user of my product, and influence that decision. So I don't know if you've noticed lately, but you'll see more ads on TV. Pharmas are actually advertising more directly on TV. Mm -hmm. and that's turned out to be actually quite good. So they're now going back to the doctor and I saw this ad. Doctor, why would you not recommend this one? So now with that, they're starting to track who these people are. They want to track, but who, is, who did read that ad? And they want to have di a dialogue and, and a, 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 uh, basically develop a relationship directly with the, end, the potential end user patient of that drug. So I got to just, uh, just yep. a plug. So our friend, yep. Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Richard Wang's doing a big study uh, right now on uh, chief data officers. So if you're a chief data officer, contact him and he wants to hear from you. I'd they're, be they're more, more, than, more than happy to share yeah, that. And, so, and that's, that's one example. So you're talking about big data. So you can imagine they want to do sentiment analysis, what's being said about their drugs and the marketplace. It's also got legal implication. Okay, are they hinting that there may be a problem with the drug that we've already got out there that we should be jumping on? Mm. Right, so proactively before the FDA does. Uh, by the way, it, what's our competition saying about our drugs, right? What are the patients saying about it? What are the trends and so on? So you, gotta monitor, you can imagine the amount of 
things you got to monitor in a, in a company of that size. Andre, I want to yeah. ask you, what are you working on now? I mean, we're doing any investing? Are you on more boards? What, what do you, what's the key things that are keeping you busy these days? Well, I'm on eight different boards, <laughs> uh, mainly on the technology. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, one of them is publicly traded, so I'm, a, I'm chairman of a publicly traded company, and the rest are all private. Are you doing I prefer any private. investments at all? Yeah, I co-invest in certain deals, um, and so, but, but big data to me, so when people say, well, Andre, big data is changing the world, I said, guys, let's not, it is, but what's really changed is the fact that most people are starting to realize, I bet you we can walk outside this hotel, let's go to the street, I'll show you some, some cut marks all over the pavement where they've embedded sensors in the road. I bet you that's only happened a few years ago. Figure out every sensor that there is, okay? I was uh, talking to a, uh, and I'll leave it nameless at this point, but a, a, a tire manufacturer that wants to actually, around a tire, put a copper bead, okay, five across, five deep, so as you're driving your car, it can figure out if it's wearing out the outer bead or the inner bead, car's not aligned properly. I'm going to send you a text message that, you know, your car's not aligned properly, you should bring it in. And as you start wearing down the depthness, I can tell, I said, by, by, based on your driving habit, and I know what your mileage is, driving your, you are, you're going to be out of compliance. In other words, your car's not going to pass inspection at the next inspection, and it's not safe. Yeah. Bring it in, and we'll change the tires for you. That's going to help the insurance companies, right. too, look at right. who's driving patterns, too. So figure out, that's four tires per car. How many sensor points? That's just the tires, right? So figure out the oil, the usage of oil and so on. We can go on and on, but just, so one application I was looking at in Detroit, uh, the guys laugh at petabytes. They say petabytes is a rounding error, okay? And, and so you figure out how many of those, the, the cars and the intelligence that are being built. So when you, you talk about big data, so to get to the point of big data, uh, there's a lot of exciting technologies that are, are being funded around on how do you extrapolate the value out of big data, right? And, and there's going to be some of the players like Acteon in the game, and there's obviously going to be some new technologies, uh, new technology companies that we may decide to partner with or we may decide to acquire, right? But we're, we're obviously keeping the eyes on, and like everybody else, of who, who are going to win and who are going to lose and which ones are going to make. Quarter of the day, John. Okay. Petabytes is a rounding error. <laughs> <laughs> Andre, we had a great conversation with, with uh, Actian, going back to Big Data NYC, mm -hmm. and you guys, uh, really impressive. Love, the, love the, the combination, love how you guys are putting it together. And again, you got a lot of room to go, grow, continue to, to do some great things. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for sharing your amazing stories. It was awesome, made the time go by really fast. Appreciate it. Well, great, thank you very much, yes, John. Okay, this is theCUBE. We'll be right back with our next guest, next guest after this short break. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, live in Silicon Valley for Big Data SVB. We'll be right back.